Well, hello, we're now down to lecture seven, human resources management and industrial relations. And this is a synopsis lecture. I've changed the graphic on the right to indicate that providing these synopsis lectures without students in front of me is a little bit like speed dating with a mute. Uh, not as enjoyable, but all the same, very pleasant. Today, we're up to lecture seven, human resources management and industrial relations. Two of the most important areas uh, in dealing as a manager. So they're the two areas we're going to cover and let's first look at human resource management. Up until the 1960s we had personnel departments, they had minor roles in the organisation, they did things such as payroll, recruitment and personnel administration. Uh, they evolved into the human resources management uh, discipline in the 1960s. And they were promised uh, were driven by promises of two psychologies like behavioural psychology and humanistic psychology that if you actually uh, dealt with staff uh, in, a, in a human way that you could get more out of them. However, due to the rapid changes in the internal and external environments there was a need to come up with a more comprehensive approach. And some of the examples uh, include things like workforce, there was now gender diversity and skills, uh, issues in the workplaces, staff flexibility, the customer perspective was changing, and there was rapid changes in the external environment. In addition to managing in more complex environments, organisations came to learn that their people were a major factor in achieving sustainable competitive advantage. Simply, effective human resources management has a positive impact on employee productivity, it improves organisational performance and leads to stronger financial results. So with this change perspective, the personnel department was retitled the Human Resources Department or similar with much broader responsibilities. And Southwest Airlines uses the term for their HR department of People Department. Human Resources Management is all the activities necessary for staffing the organisation and sustaining high employee performance. Initially, the functions of Human Resource Management were to attract, train and retain quality staff. So just three simple functions, attract, train and retain. And major responsibility for these functions was seen to rest largely with the human resources department rather than the operational managers. And again, when I joined the workforce, that's what it was like when you spoke to the person who was supervising you or managing you. You said, hey, look, I'd like to do some training. They said, oh, head off and see the human resources department. Oh, I'd like to take some leave. Oh, go and see the human resources department. So. The, uh, the line managers had very little day-to-day -day responsibility for you other than the actual work task. So the attract, train and retain approach was the, uh, they took the organisation strategy and action plans. They, uh, the concept was to uh, attract an effective workforce through various measures, train them and to retain them. And that was within the internal environment of the things like the employer HR policies, work-life balance for staff use of teams and part-time employment and so on and so forth. And the external environment was things like legislation, it was changing. The economy, again, was becoming uh, more dynamic. There were societal trends and technology, all changing the workplace. As Sir Richard Branson has said, train people well enough so they can leave, treat them well enough so they don't want to. In the last 20 years, the concept has been further developed to include the active participation of operational managers in a more inclusive approach. And this is termed strategic HRM. And this requires managers to play an active role in the daily management of staff, understanding that the employees are assets which lead to competitive advantage, and matching the human capital to achieve the organisational goals. So in a contemporary workplace, your, uh, your line manager or your day-to-day -day manager or if you're as the manager, you have responsibility for your staff in all of those aspects that previously may have been the Human Resources Department's responsibility. Strategic HRM is the linking of human resources with strategic goals and objectives in order to improve business performance and developing an organisational culture that fosters innovation, flexibility and competitive advantage. So, again, it's about this all-inclusive approach. We're all one team working towards the organisational outcomes. Some of the strategic, HR, strategic HRM activities include things that are shown here. Uh, you'll notice ethical conduct at the bottom, industrial relations, 
uh, training, learning and development. All of those are parts of the strategic HRM activities. Simply, what a manager needs to do, needs to take the human capital processes, build the human capabilities, meet the key performance drivers and achieve the business results. So it's a bottom-up approach uh, to, uh, to uh, work towards what the organisation wants, what the organisational performance uh, requirements are to meet the desired goals. In the airline industry, it's a com very competitive industry. It requires sophisticated levels of strategic planning and a very flexible and responsive workforce. The passenger industry is a customer-focusing business where staff and behaviours are drivers of competitive advantage. And this is one of the really important things about the passenger side of the business is, is, uh, the, the, is that the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the staff performance can greatly affect the uh, passenger experience. The cargo industry is a business facing business where costs and schedule are the drivers because they don't have any face to face contact with customers. Organisational culture is difficult to define but airline staff and customers recognise its impact. Packs. And Holloway, for those that are using Holloway in another course as the uh, text, he said that in an intensely competitive, in an intensive competitive marketplace where service innovations are so easily replicated, a key strategic variable that nobody can copy is an airline's culture. So people are really important to define uh, the culture of your organisation. Successful airlines continue, continually monitor their competitors and their organisational culture as well as their own performance and organisational culture. So it's a matter of saying, hey, what are they doing? What are we doing? Are they, uh, do they have a, a, a healthier culture? Are they uh, creating more uh, value for the customer just through the human interface perspective? It's important to be able to quickly absorb lessons, learn from the industry and your own organisation. So strategic HRM is the enabler to build a very flex flexible and responsive workforce. And the objective is to establish a mutual benefit or a mutual commitment between the uh, management and staff. Uh, in the full lecture, I use uh, Continental Airlines uh, as an example of human resource management. And uh, again, very interesting and it builds on your readings of Bethune uh, in the first three weeks of the course. Airlines are a service industry and they're labour intensive, uh, uh, labour intensive in the sense that airlines staff related costs are about 25 to 35 per cent. Most airlines running 25 to 30 per cent uh, of the total operating costs of the airline. They're differentiated from marketing uh, or manufacturing industries. People buy an experience rather than a manufactured problem. Uh, problem, my apologies. People buy an experience rather than a manufactured product so there needs to be a high level of customer focus. And according to Laszlo, uh, he said that service focus or service focused organisations have three critical success factors, which are management commitment, customer focus and employee involvement. So to run uh, Singapore Airlines, a benchmark airline, you need to display or to have management commitment. You need to have strong customer focus and you need to have employee involvement uh, in achieving the organisation's goals. Let's move on and talk about industrial relations. Industrial relations is the administration and control of the employment relationship in industrial societies. And administration and control in this sense reflects a range of activities including bargaining and dispute resolution through negotiation, mediation, conciliation and arbitration. And industrial events have shaped the industrial relations landscape globally, especially for airlines. And obviously changes to the industrial relations systems can impact an airline's survival. Unions have traditionally represented workers and sought to protect, protect and promote their members' interests through collective bargaining. And post-1945, most global legacy airlines, or I call them network airlines in the previous lecture, uh, with the exclusion of the United States, were owned by governments. They were highly regulated and there was little competition. And as a result, employee bargaining power was high and unions were seldom opposed by management. 
when the US airline industry was commercially deregulated in 1970, not, oops, say again, 1978, the new competitive framework slowly spread around the world. The Australian two airline policy came to an end uh, in November 1990, and that in changed the industrial landscape uh, for the airline industry in Australia. By the mid-1980s, deregulation, globalisation and cost and productivity pressures began to produce disputes, retrenchments and erosion of pay, benefits and conditions for airline employees. During the 1990s, oversupply of seats forced airlines to undergo structural and technological changes to stay competitive and in some cases to survive. By 2010, the airline industrial landscape had changed with many airlines seeking to manage industrial relations on an individual basis where possible. So airlines want to deal with people one-on-one -on -one instead of dealing in a collective basis with unions or, or uh, professional associations. And in part, this is one of the problems that is uh, with, uh, with the, uh, the older airlines, the legacy or, or network airlines uh, around the world, is they are still structured with some of their history in mind. And so a lot of the low-cost carriers come along and are challenging, challenging them because they don't have the same footprint on the ground, especially of people, to achieve their organisational goals. In the early 1990s, unionisation of the Australian workforce was approximately 40%. But this has reduced quickly. It was 20% in 2019, and it's remained steady at 18% for the last three years. So the largest employer of people uh, in Australia are small businesses, and most of the people who work in small businesses aren't members of uh, unions. Uh, but even in, for larger organisations, uh, unionisation or the numbers of people who are members of union has dropped uh, to quite a low level. The development of good labour management relations can produce positive outcomes both uh, during negotiations and once the agreement is, placed, is in place. Uh, the airline industry is a, a low margin business and any threats on its services place great financial strain on it. So it's a real issue for airlines that uh, when they have industrial issues, it does affect their profitability. And some of you who are Australian may uh, remember the, uh, the Qantas problems of two years ago. Although labour unions can significantly affect an organisation's HRM practices, usually they're not as great uh, as the influence of government laws and regulations. So often the government can make quite sweeping changes that have a great, lot greater effects than relationships with unions. Why do people join unions? Uh, unions influence the work and effort outcome. They provide a security net for employees. They influence the administration of rules. And unions have political power where individuals don't. So it's that collective basis uh, of, uh, of representing uh, the workers rather than uh, them uh, dealing individually with uh, employers. Again, the academics put this into two theoretical approaches of how organisations deal with their staff uh, from an industrial relations perspective. And one is called the unitarist approach and the other is the pluralist approach. So let's look at both of those in turn. Firstly, the unitarist approach. This assumes that each work organisation functions as an integrated entity with a common purpose and goal. Uh, we're all here together, we've got one purpose and goal, let's work together from an industrial relations perspective. And it builds on that work, some of which we've talked about in previous lectures uh, of Taylor, uh, Mayo, McGregor and Herzberg. Uh, there's descriptors uh, for this approach, uh, high commitment, high trust, high basic pay, uh, not always, sometimes it's more about esteem than is pay, profit sharing, it recognises the unions and formal collective bargaining. The pluralist approach accepts the inevitability of conflict due to the presence of a variety of groups with divergent interests, aspirations and goals. So it focuses on regulated and institutionalised relationships. And it's uh, one of those things about uh, trying to, uh, to uh, minimise the amount of power and rewards that employees can enjoy. Some of the descriptors include control of or compliance of staff, low trust, low basic pay, no profit sharing, does not recognise unions, and individually, individual bargaining. So 
In an airline, and this is very general, very general because there's always uh, specific examples that are different to it, low-cost carriers adopt a unitarist approach for cost focus. So everyone's here as a team, we're all working together. Southwest Airlines, for those that are familiar with that airline, uh, uh, accepts uh, union negotiations to represent their workers. They all work together as one team. Uh, and uh, uh, Southwest Airlines has never put a staff member off. Uh, they've, uh, they've changed their employment uh, jobs or their job specifications, but they've never actually sacked anyone uh, as they've reshaped, even with all of the different uh, changes that have occurred over to the airline industry. Uh, but people like Ryanair, very, very similar low-cost model, but they forbid unionisation. So, as I said, there's even differences in various sectors of the industry. Network carriers usually adopt a pluralist approach. So uh, it's regulated and institutionalised relationships between them and their unions. And a lot of this comes from their history and also for differentiation uh, with regards to providing services to the passengers. And some airlines may combine the best of both approaches for different work groups to fit with their overall competitive strategy. Uh, in the lecture, the full lecture, I go through a number of uh, case studies, uh, four of them, and uh, they bring out some of the teaching points that we've uh, covered up until now. Some of the learning points from the lecture are shown here. And the lecture we've covered uh, human resources management, we've looked at industrial relations, and also uh, I've presented the learning points. If you want to do some pre-reading in the text, next week we look at change management and quality management. So that's the synopsis lecture seven, uh, human resources management and industrial relations. I look forward to our next synopsis lecture. Thank you.